And to be honest with you, and I've got no shame in saying this, I, when I was answering the questions, I was I was probably winging it because I didn't really under I didn't have the answers. No one was telling us anything. Football's a small world, and the word got round we were desperate for the money. But obviously, we couldn't make any financial decisions. I had to come from Hong Kong. There wasn't any basic leadership. Lee Clark, welcome to the podcast. Oh, delighted to be here. Yeah, hey, Christy, thanks for inviting me on. No problem. Uh, my first question is, how did your football career start? Well, like many most young, well, boys and girls now, but obviously when I was playing, it was mainly just boys and uh, being in the school team, progressing onto boys club football. And then, you know, there was the playing for the city, playing for the county, and then represent my country as a 15-year-old and signing for Newcastle as a 14-year-old schoolboy going in as a to buy TS then, it's basically a scholarship now at 16 and playing professional, making my first team debut at 17. And what was it like playing for Newcastle? You mentioned Boyhood Club. What was that like in terms of getting the opportunity at a young age? I think, listen, you know, <clears throat> you're a Birmingham City fan. Anyone who supports a football club and they get the opportunity to be out on that pitch, basically living the dream. And, and that's what it was for me, basically, in terms of... I was a Newcastle United fan from the age of eight. My first game in 1980 in the old Gallagher end and uh, was there when Kevin Keegan came first time round as a player in 82 and took the club to a new level. So you never ever believe it when you're a youngster standing on the terraces that one day you can achieve that. Um, you don't understand how it really happens at the time. But as you get older, you get that opportunity and uh, when it happens, it's, it's just amazing. And we've represented the club um, you know, domestically in the Premier League and in Europe. Did, did you feel pressure playing for your boyhood club just because of that emotional factor of growing up supporting them and wanting to do well and you said living the dream then? Did you feel pressure in, in, in that regard? I did and I didn't. I did because I knew how important the football club was. I knew that a lot of people who went to work went to, to get that money so they could go to the game on the Saturday. They could enjoy the pre-match food and drink and they could get to the game then afterwards, you know, hopefully enjoying a win with their friends and if, you know, they to eat again or food or drink or whatever. I knew, you know, it was the be all and end all for the Newcastle fans. That was the pressure for me. But not the pressure of playing because I knew the, I knew the mentality of the fans and I knew that every game, if I could just come off that pitch and look myself in the mirror and think to myself, win, lose or draw, whether I've played a nine out of ten game or whether I've played a five out of ten game in terms of my technical ability, as long as I've given absolutely everything for that badge, you know, those fans will, will support us. And what was your best memory playing for Newcastle? There's many, you know, there's, there's making your debut, there's scoring your first goal, um, there's the year we got promoted to the Premier League, there's your first Premier League uh, appearance, there's challenging for the title, there's getting into Europe for the first time. Um, there's, there's, there's so many, it, it's it's difficult to list one. I mean, the, the standout one is always the first that when you, you make that debut, mine was down at Ashton Gate against Bristol City. Um, it's a 17-year-old. Um, and, uh, you know, that was that was just an amazing uh, feeling, really, for to to... Um, the player and it's a bit surreal at the time but uh, there was a good group of senior players there at the time um, you know Roy Yakin uh, Kevin Dillon Mickey Quinn Mark McGee Ray Ranson Don Burridge these were like senior lads who were good for the young players How, how were they good? Training ground that, that, that demanded a lot of myself even though I was 17 and made sure that because ultimately, it doesn't matter what your age is, you still have to deliver and you've got to be part of the team that gets results. And, and uh, you know, they put demands on what was required for us. But they protected as well. You know, there obviously was protection when you, because when you're such a young lad, you may get targeted by your opponents, especially in them days. You, you know, some of the tackles uh, then, I mean, you'd be getting straight red cards and banned for 10 games now. Um, you know, in, in that type of protection. John Anderson was another senior player. He was someone um, who, who was like a mentor for us. They, they, those guys were there. They, I knew that I was protected. So you mentioned Boyhood Club and 
really from an outsider looking in, especially Newcastle, you, you see the emotion there, the, the, the buzz of the city. And how, I'm, I'm intrigued to find out the switch between Newcastle and Sunderland. What, what was that process like? Was there, is there any thing you had to cope with maybe mentally to prepare yourself moving to, to the role of Newcastle? Any thoughts on, on that, just on that experience? At the time, um, I had a young son. Um, where I lived in Newcastle, I was probably closer to Sunderland's training ground than I was Newcastle. Um, you know, at the time, and I never hid the fact that I was a Newcastle fan. Uh, even when I played for Sunderland, I'd go back and watch Newcastle games, and there was friendly banter between the, the fans. But uh, no, this was a, a purely a professional decision, and, uh, and, and and one that was um, designed around my, my young family at the time, and ticked a lot of boxes, and it was proved right because I had two brilliant years there. The, the pressure for me, when you ask about pressure, the, the most pressure that comes on top of me is the pressure I put on myself. It doesn't come from outside. It doesn't come from outside noises. It doesn't come from the media. It doesn't come from the fans. Because I, as I know, as I've just said, for me, it was quite simple. As long as I gave my best, if any fans wanted to criticise me, that was their opinion. But if I've given my best on any given day and it hasn't worked, I can't do anymore. No, no, no person can do that. They can't. You can't do that. And if I've ran, you know, even the games where, as I said, if if, if I haven't played particularly well technically or tactically, as long as I'm given everything and I'm working extremely hard, uh, you know, I was. But that's the thing. I mean, one game springs to mind when I played for Fulham when I was captain in Fulham. We we played Manchester City at, at Craven Cottage, and I was so poor on the day. And, and what summed it up was. Um, I went to cross a ball and my cross was so poor so my technical work that day was so poor it, it ended up going over the top of David James and in off the inside of the post and got us a 1-1 draw and I, I remember going in the dressing room as the captain and apologising to the rest of the players but thanking them for carrying us through basically in terms of the, us getting a result because they were down to 10 men in terms of the technical side because I was that poor but I never gave up and uh so that, that that's a perfect example of what what I was about. It's interesting. I'll speak to um, some academics working in player care, and they mentioned the element of relocation. You mentioned your young son. I think what you find is maybe the media and fans don't necessarily see that. They see you joining the rival team or or kind of joining a team that are against Newcastle in your case, but they don't necessarily see the importance of your lifestyle, your uh, protection in terms of your family and all those other factors of supporting your young son in staying in the area. Do you think that's really relevant to maybe consider today, just on protecting players and without, making sure without, that... Without, yeah. I mean, this as well, for me, uh, Sunderland win the Championship, Newcastle win the Premier League, so, you know, and once Sunderland got promoted after two seasons, that, that's when I had the dilemma where I was thinking to myself, and I really think as a Sunderland player, uh, at St James's Park against Newcastle, or at the Stadium of Light against Newcastle, can I really do that? And and and, and if I can, fine, stay at the club. If I can it, um, don't shortchange the Sunderland fans. And in my heart of hearts, when I thought about it, I didn't think I could, and that was the reason I had to move on. As I said, my 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 main strength was all about um getting getting things um making sure I give my best, and uh, once the the, the predicament of the, both the clubs being in the same league. Uh, once that came about, I couldn't do it then, so I had to move. We had to move on then. But as you say, you know, what's thrown at footballers, and especially in the game now, is oh well, they should be able to handle it because we get X amounts of money. But you know, finances or whatever, yeah, they can make their life easier. Of course, you know what? No one's not saying that is the case, but it doesn't mean that you know things that are important, spending time with your family, being close to your family, um, having them around you for good and bad situations, seeing your children grow up, for example, being around for the school years, being around for them. You know, football at Christmas time, it's the busiest time of the season. It's probably the most exciting time as a fan. And obviously, if you're a fan who's going to watch games, the players are the ones who are having to perform. So 
regularly away from their families over that period of time, especially as the children are smaller. That can be really tough. You mentioned Fulham, um, Captain Fulham. What leadership qualities did you think you, you learned during your time as a player? And did that impact you in terms of being a manager as well? I was, I was a vocal captain, but I like to think that I, I led by example in terms of doing everything right, preparation, um, getting ready for the game, understanding of practically what was a, what was required and what the manager wanted from us. Um, seeing situations where um, a bit of strong leadership was required, helping younger players, um, seeing when people around the club, i.e. my teammates, uh, weren't particularly um, in a good place in terms of their confidence or just basically asking how family life was for them, how, you know, if we were younger, our parents or siblings making sure and if there was any issues, maybe relaying them back to the manager and his coaching staff. Mm. So they were that. Um, so yeah, those type of things, I think it's more than just putting an armband on um, and, and, and tossing the coin at the start of the game. Yeah. Especially with the way I'd done it, I, I wanted it to, to be in a, you know, I wanted it to be an extension of the manager. I wanted to, the managers I played for and the made as captain, I was 100% behind them in terms of their beliefs. Um, and if there was any issues about stuff like that, we we I'd go and speak to them in private and talk about it, and you know we we come to some common ground, and then I could be the one pushing those messages in the dressing room. Did Did you see that transition from being a player to manager? Then maybe from that experience of being a leader, did you see yourself maybe at the end of your career thinking, "Yeah, I want to be a manager. This is something that I enjoy. I enjoy leadership. I enjoy responsibility in that regard." Yeah, I did. Um, one hundred percent. I wanted to be a manager and a coach from a young age. Until I got to that top job, though, I didn't realise the, the full uh, issues that you did face. You know, if most clubs, you got uh, 30, 35 professionals, young and old, all from different backgrounds, all with different personal situations, um, all with all probably needed different motivational tools. Some needed, you know, to be pushed. Someone, you know, you needed to 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 make them aggressive to, to get the best out of them. Others, you needed to praise, and others, you needed to put your arm around and tell them that you believed in them. You know, and uh, you have to quickly find out these personalities. Um, you're dealing with when you become the top man in terms of the manager. You're upsetting probably seventy five percent of your playing staff every time you name a team because you can only name 11. Again, from a fan's perspective, looking in, you see the technical and tactical aspect of managers. People kind of come up with these formations, ways of playing. But what I sense from your point is it's all around the cultural aspect, the social side of making sure that you're keeping the group happy, team bonding, team togetherness, dealing with egos, dealing with personalities. Is that is that what you kind of, you, you learned from your experiences as, as a player and manager around coping with different egos, different personalities and keeping the morale high within dressing rooms, etc. Of course it is. And, you know, the game's changed. I mean, I can give you loads of examples of, of things where, you know, you, you know, the cold is up in the middle of the night because that, they're not happy with a situation. You know, the maybe have chewed on it and uh, or the maybe been to the pub or, the, or whatever and they've got up a bit of courage and have called you through the middle of the night to have a pop at you because <laughs> you have, have to deal with that in the right way. I've had I've had horrible situations where I've had to make the, 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 that conversation tell someone family members back the way or, 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 or something's happened. Um, and, you know, you, all the training in the world, I mean, um, never get put you in the right position for that because you're talking about, you know, an empathy with your with your players and all you all the fans see is 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 the end product at the end of that week, but they don't know what's been going on behind closed doors. You know, you, there's been criticism of me in the past. Oh, he hasn't picked that player, he hasn't picked that player. 
And there's been really strong reasons why I haven't done that, but for their confidentiality and for, for, for our my relationship with those players, I come I kind of come out in the public domain and talk about those issues. That's down to the player if he ever wanted that in the public domain. You know what I mean? And I kinda so then I kinda back myself and say, Well, I didn't click player X or player Y because we've been dealing with a personal issue for him or he had a that a family member pass away or this, that and the other and you know when I managed up in Scotland I had to inform a player that uh, his brother took his own life and I was the most man who took that phone call from his mother he, could, he couldn't find this player and uh, I was the one who then had to relay that message on I mean who, who gives me the training to pass that type of message to, to, to one of the young players I think that's the type of person you are, though, Lee. You you try and protect your players. You kind of care and warm to to your players, and it might actually jeopardise. Yeah, but your I, view of yourself. I said to you at the start, I've probably got tough love with them. I can be tough, but I can be fair, and I love to be. I love to be happy with them. I want to. I want to be that friend, but I can't be that friend because I've got to step back. It's, it's more than just picking a team. It's, that was the biggest surprise for me, how many things you had to deal with, and especially at, at Birmingham, you know, because I was the I was the total spoke, spokesperson for the club, for what was going on on and off the field. And I didn't particularly enjoy that. I'm all right with football because I believe I'm an educated man on football. I believe I've got a good knowledge of the game. But when it was coming to the finances and, and transfer embargoes and was the club, was, was there any potential buyers? It, that was out of my pay grade, basically, but I was having to answer these questions. Then, because eventually it got to the stage where most of my press conferences were very rarely the football was spoken about. It was going on in and around the football club. You get that sense a little bit now with Qatar World Cup and other political issues. You see a lot of football managers get challenged on what's happening in the news. And obviously in your case with Birmingham, there was a lot around the ownership. You mentioned leadership in terms of players. How how was leadership above you then? How how was that a challenge in terms of your time at Birmingham and dealing with you know well, the uncertainty of ownership, etc. But obviously we couldn't make any financial decisions. That had to come from Hong Kong. There wasn't any basic leadership. It, it, it was me. It was I, as I said, I was the only the one and only spokesperson about everything. Uh, that took me to school and uh, there wasn't really any leadership. I wasn't being told anything. I wasn't being told, um, you know, was the what the finances were. The only thing I got told was that we had to trim the wage bill massively in, in a certain period of time. And that, that was extra pressure that I had to bring in. And ultimately that cost me some very, very good young players who I wanted to build the team around. Mm. Um, sold them far too early in their careers at Birmingham and we sold them for far too cheap because football's a small world and the word got round we were desperate for the money and uh, you know we I achieved the goal of trimming the wage bill but it was a, the detriment of, of the team and I was eventually having to bring players in which probably put me in line with the bottom three to four clubs my wage budget in, in the championship so you know Thankfully, the, the fans and the facilities at the club, obviously Wast Hills and St Andrews, they were a big pull for the players because a lot of the players I signed in my last transfer window had better financial offers elsewhere. You were kind of the spokesperson at Birmingham City with a lot of weight on your shoulders, in I presume, from the fans and, and everyone else associated with the club and the media, etc. How, how was that in terms of maybe you mentally? It's extremely tough. I think it. I think it got... It probably took the toll on us more than I thought. Um, and to be honest with you, and I've got no shame in saying this, I, when I was answering the questions, I was I was probably winging it because I didn't really under I didn't have the answers. No one was telling us anything. And you've got to try and keep the belief of the fans. You don't basically want to say, "Oh, you know, I couldn't come out and say, for example, oh, I've been told we've got free transfer windows to slash seventy percent off the wage bill, or we could be in financial trouble." Um, you know, these are things that you, you, you can't really come out and say because you create create panic amongst the fans and 
you know, I needed them to keep supporting the team, which they've done unbelievable. But you know, I think when I look back on my time now, that took a lot of me, took a, put a lot of stress on me. That probably took away the thought processes on the football because I was having to deal with a lot of things that I shouldn't, have, that I never really wanted. I never went into management. You know, I'm a manager who identifies players, but then I let the chief executives or the owners or the chairman of the club then negotiate the contracts. I never got involved in that side. I didn't want to be. Uh, I just wanted to identify the players I wanted. But towards, obviously, when I was working under those, you know, regulations at Birmingham, I was having to try and help and advise the, the people behind the scenes on what would be the best, best way forward in terms of salary or length of contracts. So I was getting into areas that I did, didn't really want to be in and I shouldn't have been, but I knew that if I didn't do it, the, it wouldn't have been possible for us to to get the players that we we, we did, you know, under those circumstances. Do you think, looking back, maybe on that experience, you maybe would have delegated someone that role? Because I remember Dan Byrne specifically; he was on loan, running, and I think it was January. He had to go back, and there was a situation where transfers were were tight in that window. You mentioned obviously then cutting wage budgets. Do you think you would maybe delegate if you could have? Looking back on that situation, delegated. Listen, to my staff at the time: Terry McDermott, Derek Fazakli, uh, Dee Watson, Richard Beal, John Vaughan, Malcolm Crosby. They all they all give us great help. Um, what well, you know, I'm not just you know, we've done. It was a team um, part of a lot of the groundwork for the likes of Dan Byrne, Kyle Bartley, Jesse Lingard, um, those lads. That that groundwork was done behind the scenes by probably other members of staff, you know, and informing me these players could be available, then going to watch them. I remember going to the uh, League One playoff final at Wembley uh, with my son to go and watch Dan Byrne uh, and then decided that he was a player the mark that we'd go for. Watched Jesse Lingard on numerous occasions for Manchester United and uh, knew about Kyle Bartley from his time up in Scotland and in Swansea, so, you know, and uh, there was a couple of other loans. And I think, I, I remember we drew with Barnsley in the round New Year's Day at St Andrews. And I think we're on a 10-game unbeaten run. We won five and drew five. And we're just outside the playoffs. And I took a call off Julia Shelton after the game to say every single one. Because you had to, when you sign the player on loan for the season, you still had to give the parent club a week in January where they could make a decision whether they wanted to sell them bring them back to using their first or go out on loan somewhere else to, to say at that time Premier League club and all those players got recalled on the same night I remember and I had like a couple of days to try and get another five loan players in we've done that but they didn't have the same impact you know we uh, got Rusnak and Hughes from Man City we got Blackett and they just didn't it didn't work at all and we, we slumped down the league. I've got no doubt if we had kept Byrne, Bartley, Lingard, uh, we would have we would have been definitely challenging, even though we're up against it, challenging to get in the playoffs. I'm not saying we would have gotten them, but we were you know, we were we were we were putting some good good runs together. We went to Palace. Well we had Raval Morrison, we went to Palace and absolutely ripped heads out with them. They back, got promoted, took them apart and beat them four 0 um, so it was, it, it was tough. Um, and but you know my staff, all the signings that were made was great work. As Derek Fazakli was always out watching games. Me and Terry would go together. Terry McDermott, Malcolm was extremely hard, and the other lads would always be out and about at games, not just Birmingham area, London. But we did delegate. But it was, it, it, it was more than just delegation in terms of. It had gone beyond football. I was then having to talk about the finance, whereas any normal football club, um, you do a press conference, you talk about the football side of it. And if they want to know anything about the sale of a club or a, or any potential investors or the transfer embargoes or the up, um, uh, you know, can we sign players, etc. What was it? What was the rules? Um. You know, so it was. This was a new area for me. I'd never been in this, and 
But, you know, one of the embargoes was that I had to sell a player before I could bring one in. That, that player I was bringing in had to be on less salary than the one that was going out and stuff like that, you know. So, I, I, you know, it was very... I couldn't have really delegated more in terms of that. I think it was just the fact that every time there was a press conference or any the media conversation, it was, it was coming up in, in the conversation. And obviously, when, you, when you're working like that, you do worry because, you know, the... That famous game at, at Bolton when we stayed up. My my biggest my biggest fear about all that was one the fans seeing their club go to League One, but the the repercussions if the club had got relegated was usually the first people to lose their jobs or the, the people in the offices and behind the scenes who were on probably the, the the lowest wages at the club, but they're the first ones to get hit with losing their job when a club goes down and there has to be cost cutting. And what you usually find is these people in the offices at football clubs, wherever you go, they're true. They're really far, big fans of that those football clubs. So that was my biggest concern, my biggest worry going into that Bolton game was one, the fans, the loyalty they had showed, but two, if the worst had come to the worst was great people were going to lose their jobs and people who were firming them through and through and loved working for the club. Um, they would probably be the first people to be hit when the cost cutting happened. and uh, Thankfully, that wasn't the case. Were you frustrated at the owners? Did, obviously, I get the sense you're quite a people person in terms of what you said there, in terms of the, the hierarchy of the football club and wanting to protect those at the bottom. I, I could sense, I, I could imagine there's a sense of anger and frustration to those above because you're working For, towards a goal, your, re, your reputation's on the line as well. And frustration, be, well. frustration because I knew the. the the infrastructure, the club, and the fans deserved to be better than and, and get better than what was happening at the time. Um, you know, um, and you know when you're dealing with like an overseas, I'm not putting every overseas ownership group in this bracket, but what I'm saying is, at that time, uh, the ownership group at our club were just desperate for names. They weren't there. They didn't understand sometimes you didn't have to be a big superstar name to be to become to be a good footballer. Right. So I'll give you an example, but I won't I won't name any of the names of the clubs involved. There was a there was a young player um, who was coming out of a League Two club to go and sign for a Premier League club, uh, and that Premier League club I had a great relationship with the manager and Martin Crosby. He felt had a great relationship with their chief scout as well and this Premier League club was signing this League 2 player but they just felt he probably wasn't ready for the Premier League but he was certainly ready to play in the champ he's now gone on since to, to being in the Premier League for the last 10 years or so um, playing for that club he was signing for but then another club after that So he, and he's proved to be a, if I said his name you'd, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd know straight away but because he wasn't a, a well-known name, when I went to the board and asked him, and, and we were actually getting a, a huge reduction on his salary, we weren't having to pay 100% of his salary. I think we're having to pay about 25 to 30% of his salary. Um, and because I went when I went to the board and asked and mentioned this player, because he wasn't a name, they, they just said, oh, that the coffers were empty. And then I got a call about an hour later uh, to say that, would I like three well-known players from a huge Premier League club? And these three players would have cost far more money than this guy from League Two who I was trying to bring in, but would have caused me massive problems. Um, one, being a terrific player, but was had been bogged down in the last year, the 18 months with injury problems, but had been a brilliant player, but would have cost a lot of money, even if we're playing a percentage. The other one, I already had a, a young player uh, in his position and he, the young player was always going to start. So this player would have come in and not started. So there you've got a predicament where you're bringing a high-profile player in, he probably wouldn't have started. Um, in the third one, um, I just didn't, I didn't rate, but in the combined money was far superior to the money that I wanted to bring this unknown player in. And, and, and an hour, so an hour later, mysteriously, they found the finances 
to go for these three players, but thankfully I didn't I didn't allow it. So how do you deal with change then and the different personalities? You mentioned Raval Morrison, Jesse Lingard, players coming in and out. Nikola Zigic was there and I think he had a spell of coming back into the club. How do you deal with different personalities and different types of players to get the best uh, out of them and also to get the best in terms of results and bring stability? So I can imagine that's a challenge. You react in different ways. Sometimes you, you you play the psychological card, don't you? You know, the, people think, oh, um, like, for example, you might have such a poor first half, fans and everyone are thinking you're going to go in and tear strips off them, but sometimes you've got to play cool and talk, talk, you know, sensible to them, calmly to them. Sometimes after a game, if things haven't gone particularly well, probably worth it looking back, you know, probably worthwhile. Not seeing a lot of things and sleep on things and go through it with when you've seen the footage, etc. But sometimes you can make snap uh, decisions and uh, on, on what you're going to say by seeing things live in the game. And as you say, you know, if I put 11 players out on the pitch now, I guarantee you've got 11 different personalities. Um, and as I said, there's, there's certainly players. Who do need to be motivated. You need to get them not wound up, but you need to fire them up. You know, you might need to say something that the lad he's playing against is he's telling them, telling people that you know he's in for an easy game Saturday, this one, and that might fire him up. Whereas the, the guy sitting next to him might need to be told, listen, you you know, we totally believe in you, the best player in, in this league in your position or whatever, might need that type of situation. Did your time ever as a player or a manager ever impact your mental health at all? You, you mentioned some of the pressures then from owners and other factors. Just on reflection of maybe your, your managerial career and your, your playing career, was there a moment that kind of stands out? Because there's a, there's a big taboo around mental health and some of the people I've interviewed over the course of the last couple of months have talked and opened up around mental health. Is there anything that maybe stands out or anything that you can reflect on that, that has, has challenged maybe your psychological um, element? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, listen, I'm a man who um, takes on a lot of responsibility. I, I, whichever club I go to, I buy into that club totally. And uh, the fans, as I said, I'm I'm a fan. So I, the responsibility I've got to them is huge. So as a manager, if we, if we lose any given game, I totally take on that responsibility myself. Have I picked the right team? Have I done the right tactics? Have I made the right decision? Preparation. And it got to the stage where that was happening. And then when we won, I wasn't enjoying it for long enough because I was then starting to prepare for the next game. I was just totally focused. But if we'd lost, I was letting it chew for three, four days. And it was it did get me down, yeah. There, there has been there has been, you know. It's been very, very tough periods. Um, and, you know, certainly the times, you know, it, 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 it Birmingham, because of where we were, well, the predicament when we were going hurtling down the road to the league, that was becoming very, very tough. And, uh, you know, the say who motivates the motivator, so, and, and, who, and who puts it in times, and it's, it's difficult. You try not to take it home to your family life, but that's easier said than done because you're thinking about the game 24 7. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it, it, it's. I miss the game. I'm out of it at the moment. I miss the game. I, I'm enjoying watching it as the fan. I don't miss those pressures of when you're not winning. I don't miss those at all. Did you ever seek support during those? Pressured situation. Uh, yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. No, did you, not. Did you find that useful? Yeah. Not at first. I didn't, and that was tough. And it was tough on my family, on my friends. They could see the change, and uh, but yeah, the you know the LMA, great people, Richard Bevan and his staff there. Everything, every resource you need, couldn't do enough for you couple of phone calls with them and got some support, you know, um, which has been 
ongoing and uh, been very, very helpful for us. What, what advice would you maybe give to someone that might be experiencing stress, anxiety, um, other factors around mental health within football or maybe in life? Is there anything that you've 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 experienced that you'd like to share with maybe people that are listening or watching this? Just got to share it. Please don't keep it in. Don't don't think nobody wants to listen to you. Don't think there's not understanding people there. There's there's experts out there. They're, they're, go and speak to somebody. Please go and speak. Just don't don't bottle it up. It's it, it, when you bottle it up, it's not not helping anyone. It's making yourself worse. And everyone's prepared to listen. There's there's no stigma about this scenario anymore in, in the in the age. Anyone I think you go to. They'll try and help you. They'll try if they can't help you. They'll try and put you on the right path to getting help, professional help. Um, you know because it's it's an awful thing. Um, you know you this life for living, and you want to enjoy it as often as you can. You will have your ups and downs. You know, but you don't want uh, a lot of the things that you're worrying about can can be rectified. A lot of the things that are making you feel unhappy, disappointed. Um, not good about yourself. Um, if you share it with people, um, that's probably when I was at my worst. I wasn't sharing it with people. I was keeping everything in, and I had a great path behind me. And I wasn't, you know, opening up to them about certain things or whatever, you know. Um, and, and once I did, it helped me personally. And uh, you know, it's ongoing. You, you, you know, you can always. You, you, do, you, you now I understand like the warning signs stuff like that. So I try to be able to monitor them, but I still got a great network of people. And and what I've been is a, I've never been afraid to, to talk to family and friends about it now. So they understand and what I've gone through, and they can see sometimes the signs as well. So that's helpful. Why would you think there was a stigma around mental health, especially? In, in football, hyper masculinity, even even men in general. In football, when I started, it was, you know, you're classed as weak if you were talking about anything like that. You know, you was classed as uh, professional sport. You had to be hard. You had to be strong. Be to do this and do that, and you know that was a sign of weakness. If something your mental health wasn't working the way you wanted it to work, but uh, no, that's not the case now. It's not frowned upon. It's not. It's not. Not seen as a weakness. It's been that you've been quite strong and you've been powerful and you're, you're looking after you, yourself. Um, and I think that's the important message. Someone who asks for the help and wants to seek the help and wants to talk about it. You're actually being a strong personality about if you do. Um, you're not being weak because you're, 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 you're sensing that something isn't right, and you want to you want to get back to your number one personality. I mean, that was the big thing for me. I was I was a bubbly character. I was laughing a minute. And I think, you, you know, you sense the change, but you can't, you, do, you don't know how to stop it. And you see, you get people from around you, close people to you who've know to start change, and they see that. And it's not nice. You don't, you don't want to be that personality. You don't, you don't want to live that life. You want to be the person that you were. And, yeah. Uh, but that's the thing. So you, I think people, when you talk to someone about it, they feel quite positive. They feel quite strong for you, and they want to help you because they can see that you're, you're feeling a bit, and you want to try and help yourself. Do you find yourself being a little bit more aware of that with your son? You know, I know your son's in the professional game. Do you find yourself maybe supporting him a little bit more in that regard, just because of your experiences of of being a player as well as a manager? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, listen, um, he's got his coaches, he's got his, his teammates. He wants a little bit of football advice from me, yeah, but I'm here as his father and I'm here to support him. You know, the pressures now is insane in terms of social media, you know, the, the content that the clubs send out to the sending videos and stuff of training. So, People are commenting on them and new training. They comment on how they look. They comment on how they play. The young players of today are into social media, so they see the good things that are said. They see the bad things that are said. So about me being there to support him, being ready for him, because I know there's going to be ups and downs in his career. 
and being ready for both, not getting too it, getting too excited when the ups happen, and not getting, you know, being there for them when the when the unfortunate downs happen. They might be for different things. They might be loss of form. They might be long term injury or whatever. Then you know, it, it, there's, a, there's a multitude of things that can set things off like that. So yeah, it's um, uh, yeah, yeah, it's really important for me. If you could go back, you could change one thing in terms of your career, what would you do and how would you do it again? Well, I came into Blues as a manager, as a, a very highly sought-after young manager, after what I did in the Curtis Field. Um, you know, with the unbeaten run and the players that I taught, taught the club and changed the philosophy of the club and the value of the team. And I was really excited on July the 1st when I accepted the Blues job. I thought I could. This was my opportunity to become a Premier League manager by getting them promoted and going into the Premier League with Birmingham. And uh, it would probably be that whole situation. Probably thinking my ego took over a little bit. Thinking even though things had changed dramatically in about two or three weeks after accepting the job in terms of club. I could still achieve what was expected when really when you look back it would nigh on impossible and probably to save my own and being a bit selfish to save my own um, reputation probably got out and then being able to explain what I, the, the, the dynamics working under um, but it was a challenge that I thought I could take on and it took its toll Mentally, physically, um, I didn't I didn't really recover in terms of when I left Blues. I got sacked by Blues. My ego was hurt, and I ended up taking on a crazy job at Blackpool. That was just absolutely impossible. And I think probably those two stopped me going on to probably achieving my, my my dream as a manager, and that was to manage in the Premier League and uh, you know change probably the. Um, the the outlook of the man on the street about my management credit. Um so yeah that, that that that's probably the stuff. Probably being a bit more selfish, probably I probably should have thought about more myself rather than the club at Birmingham and even before Christmas probably could have got out. But I'd never I was still a young manager. I'd, I'd only had one job. I'd never quit ever. I'd only had three clubs as a player wasn't in my makeup so but looking back now with in hindsight I probably would have saved my, my reputation and um, who knows Steve Clark thank you for your time today thanks very much all the best